Hi, I'm Erin O'Hara, Executive Director of the Tennessee Education Research Alliance. And I'm Laura Booker, Executive Director of Research at the Tennessee Department of Education. And this is the 10th period. Welcome back to our third episode of the 10th period, which is a podcast designed to bring you the latest in education research and education in the state of Tennessee. Uh, Today's podcast, we're going to be covering reading and the department's latest reading report. And what we generally try and do on these podcasts is cover some recent research that's either been done by the Tennessee Education Research Alliance or our partners at the Tennessee Department of Education. And uh, we've done two podcasts before. You can find them on iTunes and SoundCloud. If you've found this one, then you've probably found the other two. Um, You can also sign up for those podcasts there. And the podcasts in the past have been about teacher improvement in Tennessee and also Um, the Response to Intervention and Instruction Program in Tennessee. And so today we're going to be talking about the department's third annual report on early grades reading. We're going to be talking to Molly Auger, Project Director for TNTP, who's been conducting observations of early grades reading in Tennessee and literacy instruction in Tennessee. Uh, Beth Davidson, who's a second grade teacher in Weekly County, Tennessee. And Vicki Kirk, Deputy Commissioner and Chief Academic Officer at the Department of Education. So, Laura, before we get started today, I know um, I was at the reading report launch, and I heard you talking a little bit about your kids and reading. And I'm curious, what's your favorite book to either read with your kids or for your kids in their own reading? So that's right, Erin. I have a one-year-old and a two-year-old, both girls. And... My favorite book right now, I guess, that we've been reading is something called Babies on the Go. So it's got all the different ways that I think people and different animals carry their babies. And Eva, who is my two-year-old, almost three-year-old, we really like to go to the zoo. And so it's a lot of fun to talk about the different animals in the book and look at how they're carrying their baby. And the Nashville Zoo has a fantastic kangaroo exhibit. And so we make some connections to seeing the kangaroos at the zoo and think about how they carry their babies. Um, My favorite book actually growing up, though, was a book called um, The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin. Um, I I remember reading it in fourth grade and then reading it every year thereafter all the way through school. Cool. So I I was thinking about this and um, Laura and I were talking about our favorite books and favorite children's books earlier. And I I found myself feeling a little bit intimidated about trying to answer this question myself. So what are my favorite children's books that I read with my kids? Because as part of the reading report, one of the things that you all talk about is sort of foundational skills and fluency and these things. And I wonder, are the books that I read with my kids good books? I have no idea. And I know we'll talk probably a little bit about that later. But um, two of the book series that I really like for my kids Um, there's this series that one of them is called Rosie Revere Engineer. And um, there are a couple of these types of books, and they're both sort of a little bit fantastical about uh, about the professions that people might be in. And also they are instructive about sort of what is an engineer and what is it. There's another one called um, Iggy Peck Architect. And uh, my kids love these because it makes them sort of think about what could they do when they grow up. Um, And then another series that I love that my kids have started reading are these who is books. So who is Barack Obama? Who is uh, Abraham Lincoln? Who is Rosa Parks? And what's so cool about them is that they're at this sort of higher level than my kids can necessarily access. um, And they have more background information than my kids know about. But then we get into these really awesome conversations about sort of historical fact. And if I were a person who was more inclined towards science... I might have that same reaction to the engineer books, but uh, the history books really are what work for me. Erin, when I first got into some of this early grades literacy research, even though I was a second grade teacher, I kind of had the same insecurities about yeah. the books that I was reading my my own children. I immediately was like, oh, no, everything I'm reading them is fiction. Do I need to run out and buy a bunch of nonfiction books? And I did actually run down to McKay's, which is our used bookstore. <laughs> makes me feel so much better. <laughs> and uh, Because really, we do have it, most, mostly fiction books in our house. But after kind of getting into this and learning that like bedtime stories are a great time for just whatever it is that engages your st- your your children at home and letting them kind of have some choice over that is perfectly fine so you should not feel bad at all and although those sounded like actually great choices probably for inside the classroom as well. I did work a little bit on figuring (laughs) out which ones actually also sounded a little bit more intelligent so um, but let's go ahead and now um, we'll get into actually just the the first segment so our first segment always about the research our second segment is which we put um, an educator on the spot and then our last segment we'll talk to uh, Vicki from the Department of Education so let's go ahead and we'll start with uh, Laura talking about the report. Laura, the name of the report that you all have just released um, on the sort of three years of reading and specifically on this third year is First Steps. 
It's in the third year. Why are we calling it First Steps? So the department has a goal around 75% of third graders being proficient in reading by 2025. And when I was doing the math on that, I actually realized that my one-year-old, um, she will actually be a third grader in 2025. And so I started thinking about how she's taking some of her first steps. And even though we are you know, a, a little bit into this work, about a year and a half, two years, we are still have a long way to go. And this is hard work. This is, I mean, we're talking about significant shifts to the way that our early grades teachers have been trained to teach and the way that they're teaching. And so it, first step still felt appropriate as we're kind of thinking about the messages to people that this is a long game. This isn't something that is just a short term fix. Yeah. And and I know it's something we've been working on in the state of Tennessee for a while now, but it, we'll get into talking a little bit with Molly about the specifics of sort of how you all are learning some of the information you're learning in the classrooms. But can you tell us a little bit just about the findings of the report? Sure. So we take a look at some assessment data, some observation data, and then just some stories um, from our educators through the educator survey and through some qualitative work. Um, but from our assessment, we see that um, in 2016-17 on our T and Ready assessment, um, it shows that students um, are performing similarly to that how they're performing on the national assessment, the NAEP, the gold standard assessment, with one third of third graders achieving at a proficient level and similar um, data from our optional grade two assessment where we had about 100 districts participate last year. And then we did some deeper dives actually into that data to see kind of which competencies students were doing better at and which ones they weren't doing as well at. And we saw that students were performing relatively well in the areas of listening comprehension, vocabulary, and language, but they were really still struggling a lot with reading comprehension, foundational skills, fluency, and writing. So just to clarify, Laura, when you talk about the areas on the assessment, do you mean here the second grade assessment or are you talking about the third grade assessment? I'm actually talking about both assessments okay. and there's some more details in the report and the board actually pulls some items from the assessment and shows kind of line by line, item by item, which what percentage of students got certain items right. So okay. I think it's a great resource for it people It looks at look sort of at. the category of item, right? Vocabulary... That's right. That's you can you can see you can see that on the on the in the report. Yeah, that's super helpful. And also, that's the type of thing that actually educators can look at on their own, right? That's right. Um, most of the department's items that are on the previous year's assessment are released publicly mm. for public for teachers um, to to take a look at. Um, but let me also talk about some of the observation data that oh, we talk about in the report, um, which is that we see that teachers are really implementing our new, more rigorous standards, and they're incorporating some of the instructional strategies that we advocate for as part of the Read to Be Ready coaching network, which is this, the big initiative that we've implemented in Tennessee to try to hit that 2025 goal. Um, and then we've also released something called Teaching Literacy in Tennessee, which is um, a theory of action for early grades literacy instruction. So we really see that you know that information has gotten out there and that people are implementing some practices such as interactive read aloud and shared reading. But what we also see from our observation data is that while students are successful fully completing the tasks that their teachers are giving them, those tasks are not really reflecting the demands of the new standards. And because of that, we all, and because of some additional data from the observations, we really see three areas for instructional improvement moving forward. First, um, we would really want to focus on higher quality and appropriately complex text that are selected to build students' conceptual knowledge. Um, so building knowledge about historical figures, you know, and we're trying to think about how to tie that to some of our science, social studies, fine arts, um, and other really great literacy kind of theme standards. Um, we're also, um, we also see from our data that question sequences and tasks um, are not as strong as they could be, um, you know, with a lot of them focused on just basic recall of details, as opposed to questions or tasks that build students' critical thinking skills. And by these things, you mean the kinds of questions that teachers are asking of That's their right. students. The questions that they're asking their students and then there are the writing assignments or um, that they're giving their students mm -hmm. to, to do after they've read aloud a book. Yep. Um, and then third, um, we also see a need for better foundational skills instruction um, that get, would give students actual opportunities to practice those skills. Um, so there's some great examples in the report. And we actually also released um, some one pagers tied to each of these areas that give an example of weak practice and strong practice in each of these areas, yep. as well as some kind of look fors for our leaders and our coaches um, within each of these areas as we try to um, get additional teacher improvement. 
So, great summation of the report. I have a bunch of questions, actually, that I want to ask based off what you just said, but I think let's take a minute, and we're going to bring in our guest, Molly Auger from TNTP, and then we'll get into some of those questions. Yes, let's do it. Molly, tell us what's your favorite book for kids? Favorite book for kids? Um... I think Stella Luna is, is topping ah, the list. Yeah, I, I remember Stella I have fond Luna. memories of that. Yeah, yeah, when I was little, and also I've seen it in classrooms, um, and kids love it, and with good reason. What do you love about it? It's beautiful. I, I think that's one of the pieces. It's It's got a beautiful um, theme to it, a beautiful message, and layers of messages in there that you can dig into, mm-hmm. and the illustrations are also really fun. Really cool. Um, so yeah, so I see get, kids get really jazzed up about it. Nice. So we've been working with um, Molly and TNTP to do observations um, to help us evaluate the impact of the Read to Be Ready coaching network work. So we selected 18 schools that we have been going in and observing multiple times over the course of the three years um, specifically of the coaching network. And then TNTP has actually also been working to build up some capacity of our districts and our regional offices to kind of do some of these content specific observations related to early grades reading to help really pinpoint areas for improvement. Um, So the data that's in the report um, is around some of those 18 schools, but then it's also pulled from other schools um, where TNTP and the department's um, ELA, English uh, Language Arts Consultants, have been working. As part of the Tennessee Early Literacy Network? Um, As part of the Tennessee Early Literacy Network, which is a group of districts who are specifically working on ideas around continuous improvement. Um, And then also in some of our districts who have not been able to participate in the coaching network. And the data from those places point to some of the same areas for improvement that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And the data um, from year one to year two of our Read to Be Ready work also helped us identify areas where we really had not seen improvement. And those are the areas that we've really been targeting, um, the quality of text, questions and tasks, and foundational skills instruction. Great. Molly, can you tell us a little bit more about, in your experience and the observations across the state of Tennessee, what you've been seeing? as successes and areas of challenge? Sure. Yeah. So for some of the context, TNTP has um, been privileged to partner with the Department of Education here since 2015. So we've seen some of this transition in the early stages. And there are some exciting stuff going on. Um, In particular, what we're seeing is teachers are really honing in on and hearing the message and the call for more complex texts. And in particular, when we talk about text complexity, there are many facets of complexity. One of those is quantitative complexity, so measured um, technically or mechanically by things like uh, lexile, for example, so word frequency or sentence and word length. Um, and so we're seeing an increase in the complexity levels um, quantitatively that of the text that teachers are putting in front of their kids, particularly for read aloud. So for the, during the literacy block to build students' knowledge and vocabulary, reading aloud those texts that have th- that, those higher quantitative values. So we're seeing an increase and a bump there, and intentionally so from teachers across the state, which is really exciting. Um, In terms of areas that we're still pushing on and we're thinking about are the other facets of complexity. So when we choose appropriate texts, not just thinking about the quantitative number that's on it that makes it complex, but also what makes it qualitatively complex, which is the thing that's a little bit trickier because it takes an actual reader to analyze the text and pull out and identify whether or not a text has those features. So we talk about qualitative features and we're talking about things like meaning. Does the text have multiple layers of meaning that readers need to dig into? Is the author's purpose um, implicit and you have to make some inferences to get there or is it explicit? Is the structure um, intricate or is it straightforward? Are there knowledge demands here that you're they're assuming on the behalf of the reader that you're coming to that article or to that text with that you actually need to make sense of the text? Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about the, the challenges that you've seen here. Do these mirror challenges in other states? Are we experiencing something different in Tennessee than you're seeing nationally? No, these are largely shared challenges. So TNTP has been fortunate to work with um, large districts, small districts, state departments of education across the country, and we're seeing largely the same things, um, which is to be expected. A lot of states, as they've moved to new and revised standards, are those standards are grounded in the very same research base as Tennessee's revised standards. And so they're shared challenges, these shifts that we're making, particularly in literacy, um, the, the three big shifts and changes to instruction. 
Um, what we are seeing, though, that's unique in Tennessee is a different way um, about supporting those shifts that we're asking educators to make. So we, first of all, setting the vision, um, as Laura had mentioned, teaching literacy in Tennessee, giving educators a really clear picture of what can it look like and what should it look like and why. And teaching literacy in Tennessee puts that out there for K through third grade literacy instruction. But the Department of Education is also going steps further um, to think about and really make a significant investment in the support. What do you think you would say, if I had to pick one or two things, I think the state needs to double down on both based on the observations that I've seen and then also the subsequent data, both on our state tests and and even recently on the NAEP results. What would you say the state needs to focus on these two or three things? So I think looking at text complexity and making sure that we are valuing all the facets of complexity. The second piece is really what we're asking kids to do with those texts when we have that valuable instructional time. And this, to me, is one of the most critical shifts that educators um, are being asked to make. And it's to me, it's much more than a shift. It's really a huge, significant change is saying instead of thinking about what is the skill or the standard that my students are going to work on today and going to master and what are the texts that are going to be used for practice, we're actually asking educators to kind of flip that on its head and say, what are the worthy texts that my kids need to be exposed to because of the knowledge, the vocabulary, and the complexities? And how do the standards work in service of my kids deeply understanding that text? And our questions and tasks need to kind of pinpoint and target those complexities. And in that way, we naturally integrate a lot of the standards, just in the way that we as readers ask ourselves questions as we read and make sense of, of new texts ourselves. We wouldn't necessarily say, What's the main idea of the sentence? What is the main idea of the sentence? I'm comparing contrasting, but we would naturally ask ourselves many of the different questions that would then align to standards. So I think that focus on doubling down on complex texts that are worthy of time and attention um, instructionally, and then that second piece of what are we asking kids to do with those texts? Yeah, and one of the things I know I've heard from uh, researchers I've talked to here at Vanderbilt about literacy knowledge building is also that one of the big areas we're still missing broadly in terms of increasing the shows in your data is um, increasing background knowledge. And actually, there are so many kids who are just struggling to get to that point of fluency and comprehension because they don't have the background knowledge. And so focusing, we, we've narrowed standards and you know focusing both on science and social studies in service of learning more and learning to read in a in a more complex way seems useful. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that when we talk to our t- teacher here in a little bit. And I think we might have time for one more question, Laura. Y- yes, I wanted to ask, Molly, when you have seen strong practices in our classrooms, what about the context seems to be supporting that? So the first thing that comes to mind is aligned materials coupled with the support that's needed to implement them, um, which which also makes a lot of sense. We have shifted expectations. We've shifted standards, giving educators materials that align to those standards and immediately changing the content that students are working with on a daily basis is going to give you that bump. But we know that instructional materials, while critically important, are not a panacea. They are not a cure-all, and they absolutely cannot just stand on their own to get the change in the outcomes that we want to see for kids. They need support. So we talk about support. One thing that seems fairly basic but is also really important is just making sure that educators have the materials in their hands and are able to actually dig into them, internalize them, ask questions um, ahead of time so that they feel comfortable. The second piece is, and sometimes we overlook this because we, because of the momentum and the urgency with which we are um, going at this, um, this issue and trying to increase student outcomes, is investing in the why. So why this set of instructional materials over another and having that conversation with leaders um, in districts, with leaders of schools, with teachers, with parents and students in many cases, talking about why this set of materials, what does it bring to the table for teachers, what are the benefits for students, how do the materials reflect the research base and also align to the standards. So those things are critically important. The materials piece has also come out of our survey work that we do with Tara. Um, We saw that our early grades teachers reported four and a half hours spent just sourcing materials. And because of that work and because of some of the stuff that we've been doing with TNTP, um, the department actually released unit starters, um, which are um, high quality units with interesting, rigorous text and uh, engaging student questions and assignments that are meant to build students' reading skills and their science knowledge. Um, They incorporate practices from the coaching network and from teaching literacy and Tennessee. Um, And we're going to talk to actually an educator who's been piloting some of those in her classroom next. So perfect transition to talk to our educator about the materials that she's been using in her classroom and ask her some other questions about how all of this work has felt on the ground. So thanks so much, Molly, for joining us. And thanks for the great work you all are doing in Tennessee. Thanks, Molly. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, Erin, now we're going to put Beth Davidson on the spot. Beth is a second grade teacher at Martin Primary in Weekly County. Hi, Beth. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, thank you. So, Beth, the department has prioritized three areas for instructional improvements um, based on some of the observation findings that we've been doing and that are reported in the reading report. I'm curious, so just to review, those are high quality text, um, high quality question sequences and text, and improved foundational skills instruction. And I'm curious, what's helped you improve in those areas? Um, Definitely the unit starters have helped me improve in those areas. Um, When the state put those out, um, they seem to do a great job of addressing each one of those areas. Um, The the students have really grown a lot with that, and my instruction has changed quite a bit. So we're looking for higher-level text now, um, looking for more text that has implicit and explicit vocabulary embedded in it. The question sequencing, that's where we've seen the biggest jump. Um, Before we started all of this, we were doing isolated questions, like what are the characters, you know, what is the setting, those kind of questions. And now we're asking the students to dive deeper into the text and making connections, not only in that text to themselves, but also across other texts as well. So Beth, can you give an example of that, what you were just talking about in terms of uh, asking more complex questions within a text? Yes, absolutely. Um, For example, the students are asked, um, one of the questions actually in this last unit starter was asking students after we read a book about the life cycle of a sea turtle, it was uh, called Into the Sea. And the students were asked, you know, what do you think is the most dangerous part of the sea turtle's life cycle? And that's that's a loaded question for a student because there's five stages, and so they were really having to conceptualize each one of those stages and the dangers for the sea turtle based off the text that we had read. Um, and one particular student actually said that when the sea turtle goes back to her beach where she was hatched from, it's the most dangerous part. And I asked her, well, why would that be the most dangerous part? And she said, because of the lava. And I said, the lava, (laughs) where did the lava come from? And she starts conceptualizing back to the previous unit starter that we did back in the fall and said, well, volcanoes can be dormant and become active. And so she could have been born on a beach with a dormant volcano while she was out at sea growing. The volcano could could have become active, went back to the same beach, and the lava killed her. (laughs) So, Beth, can you give me a, an example of sort of how the process works for you now that looks different from how it did before? So how you start from sort of the selection of a more complex text all the way through um, how you're asking questions. So how you might tell another teacher how to do the same thing. Um, before we started this process, we were doing isolated skills, and we would teach that skill and test that skill. And to be honest, we didn't really look at that assessment until it was Friday and we pulled that Friday test out. Um, Now I think we're seeing that we need to start with the end in mind. We're starting with those daily tasks, seeing where we need students to go for that day, making sure we get those students there, and then not only looking at that daily task, but also looking at that culminating task and how important it is that that daily task is leading up to the culminating task. So that's kind of where our planning process has changed um, Whereas, you know, before we were, like I said, just doing the skills in isolation. The text, we're obviously now looking for text that has much higher levels, um, actually going in and researching those uh, quantitative and qualitative measures of the text to make sure we're getting text that meets the needs of our students, making sure that it has that vocabulary very deep in it. And we're also spending more time creating text sets, you know, taking that, that topic that we are on for that for that week or that unit and making sure that we have other texts that support that, uh, not only just for the mentor text, for the interactive read aloud, but also text for the shared reading pieces and for the small group instruction as well. And, the, of course, the shared reading and the small group instruction text, those are looking more like on grade level text or possibly even a little below grade level for the small group instruction based on what those students are needing. Beth, I think you even mentioned to me that some of your students were even kind of creating their own text sets. Yes, we have had students doing that. (laughs) 
Uh, they've been scouring classroom li- libraries and bringing text up to teachers and um, one class, and they run to my room when they find it. They're like, Miss Beth, Miss Beth, look at what we found. And I get just as excited as they did do. And so it's been wonderful seeing the students getting involved in this process, too, and them not even realizing that they're getting involved. That's exciting. Um, I just have one um, last question for you, which is just to talk a little bit about the challenges that you have faced. You know, change is hard, and I'm curious how you have maybe overcome some challenges and maybe how the coaching has come into play. Absolutely. Um, Coaching has been been a huge piece of this puzzle for us. Um, When we took this on, our coach, our building coach, and our read-to-be-ready coach both have been very integral pieces of this for us. They've been there right by our sides helping us. If something hasn't worked, finding new ways to help us. I know that our Read to Be Ready coach has also helped us try and implement some other pieces as we are ready for those. As far as the challenges go, it's just a new way of thinking. And a lot of teachers may not be there yet or open to that new way of thinking. And so that is a challenge. But, man, if you can find that teacher or find that classroom that's near you, that's that's embracing this change and can jump on board with their excitement. I think that's a big way to overcome that. For me, seeing others having success is very inspiring to myself. And that's something that the group that I was with, with this pilot unit, our team really worked together with collaboration. And that's how we've gotten over a lot of the challenges is leaning on each other and finding out what went well for one of us may not have went well for the other one and how did they deliver that versus how did you deliver that. That's a huge piece of that is that collaboration. And I'm not real sure if the state necessarily intended these unit starters to to cause collaboration, but it has definitely caused us to collaborate and has been a big piece of that. On our survey last year, we actually saw that teachers participating in Read to Be Ready were reported collaborating more really? around, um, d- yes, on selecting text and on developing tasks. That's so oh, interesting. that's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's great. And uh, Beth, actually, you just answered a question. I had two questions left for you. One was actually about what advice would you give another teacher on sort of how to start down the line of the work you're doing? It sounds like, you know, looking at some of these unit starters, thinking about collaborating on picking, uh, you know, uh, the right kinds of texts are, are important for teachers. What advice would you give to the State Department of Education? So what would you say to the state um, they should do next in order for this work to be really more impactful statewide? Definitely create more unit starters because <laughs> we're a huge fan of them. And we have tried to create some of our own and and they are great, don't get me wrong, but the rigor that the state's been able to put out has been exactly what our students have needed and have thrived from. Um, I also think as a teacher, the state also could provide some more trainings on all of the pieces of this program. I know different schools are in different uh, sections or different areas of this development, um, and I know that the state provides training as needed, but I also would love to see them reach out to other school systems as well. I know some have not become read to be ready uh, school systems, but man, it's it's doing great things for these students. And I wish that even more school systems could see the success that we've been having. That's so great to hear. And I actually have one more question. I know Aaron and I both just keep having one more question for you because we're enjoying talking to you so much. But one question we actually asked um, the other two people who are joining us for the podcast today is, um, what is one of your favorite children's books? Oh, wow. I know you probably have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I do. And I must say this has actually become one of my favorites this year. Um, And I think it's because I've been exposed to so many new texts this year. And one of those things is that um, the Of Thee I Sing text, it's uh, actually written by Barack Obama. And he's written the story to his daughters. And it goes through all the people in history and all the impacts that they had. And basically, it takes the time to show the students that you can make a difference, too. And I just, I felt so inspired by that text. My students felt so inspired by that text. And they still go back to that text. 
That's I'm so excited, Beth. I I have a first grader and a second grader, um, and one of the things that I said earlier about texts that I love are those um, "Who Am I" books, the or, or "Who Was," "Who Is Barack Obama," "Who Was Abraham Lincoln," "Who Is." Uh, yes, Mars. I yes. love those books. So I'm going to go out and get of the I sing. Um, and read it to my children in honor of your birthday. So um, oh, before you. we leave, we also just wanted to say thank you so much um, for joining us on your birthday, which is a special day. Um, but thank you as well just for being a part of the work that you're doing um, with the Read to Be Ready Network, but of course always for the work you're doing to guide and shape the students of our future. So um, thanks so much for your time. And um, again, have a great birthday. Thanks, you're Beth. You're welcome. And thank you very much for having me. Okay, so now is the segment on the podcast where what we do is talk with one of the folks from the Department of Education who is really deeply involved in the work that we're discussing. So today we're talking with Vicki Kirk, De- Deputy Commissioner and Chief Academic Officer at the Tennessee Department of Education. Hi, Vicki. Hey. Welcome to the 10th period. We um, Today we've talked earlier with Molly Auger from TNTP uh, about their observation findings and some of the work that's in the report that you all um, released and then talked with Beth Davidson, who, as you know, is a second grade teacher um, in Weekly County, uh, about the what it has been like to be a teacher participating in the in the Read to Be Ready coaching network. Um, before we get started, we're going to ask you the same question we asked both of, both of them, which was, what is one of your favorite books for young children? So recently, when I've been doing read-alouds in schools, um, I picked Skippy John Jones. because, And I don't know if you're familiar with Skippy John. My but even... son did Skippy John Jones for his uh, kindergarten project um, and painted a pumpkin that, to look, oh. that, that he thought looked like Skippy John Jones. He might have been the only that's, one. <laughs> that's terrific. I have a, a stuffed Skippy John in my apartment in Nashville because it, it was a gift to me. What do you but love I, about I can, Skippy John? Well, I can read it in an accent, so that's always fun. And the <laughs> Spanish is fun. But uh, there's some sort of um, jokes that second graders adore uh, about Skippy John. He's just silly. And uh, so the children really get the jokes in the book, and I think it's a lot of fun to read. Yeah, thanks, Vicki. Um, so I'm going to jump into asking you a little bit about what the department is doing um, to uh, tackle some of the challenges that are identified in the report we released this week. Well, um, Laura, you already mentioned our focus areas, and that's really important, um, focusing in on some specific changes that teachers and administra- administrators can make um, actually now that will result in better instruction. Um, as you stated earlier, bringing in stronger, appropriate text, good question sequences and aligned tasks, and explicit systematic foundational instruction connected to text, to reading and writing. Those are all very important. And so developing a focus around those things is, is important for us to address challenges. Uh, we are performing observations um, through our core offices called literacy learning walks with districts and school leadership. And we focus on these areas when we do those literacy learning walks. Uh, Once these leaders see where their gaps in instruction are, we can work collaboratively to establish concrete next steps for improvement. Um, For example, if we observe classrooms for 90 minutes and only observe students working in actual text for seven minutes, a good place to start is to select some high-quality text and plan lessons that have students interacting with the text. So, Vicki, you're a a former superintendent. And as you think about this, and we we talked to Beth about this a little bit. If you were to think about the process for getting from where a lot of folks might be today in terms of how they're doing text selection all the way through to questioning and some of the um, the strategies you all are talking about, how might you recommend people start thinking about those things? I think the first thing to think about is is the materials you're using. Uh, making sure that they're appropriately complex for your purposes and making sure your planning includes lots of time for students to interact with them in various ways. Um, A a good place to start, in my opinion, is where we started with Read to Be Ready is with interactive read aloud. And I'm actually proposing that for a school I'm working with right now who isn't using anything. That's a good place for them to start is by reading to children and uh, having discussions with them around comprehension uh, and good questions to dig into the text to model for them 
how, how a reader thinks. So I think that would be the best place to start. And But then uh, there's just a lot of work to do there. Uh, you, we would want to plan an, an arc of learning for the teachers so that once they have the right materials, then they can move through and, and learn the things they need to know how to do in terms of planning for questions and tasks. Can you talk a little bit more about the training guides that you were mentioning that you all are doing for mm-hmm. school districts and how districts might think about using those? Yeah, so these are called PLPs or professional or professional learning packages, and they uh, ha- are a series of PowerPoints and videos and other materials that uh, districts can use to sequence training for teachers as they're implementing the unit starters. They explain uh, the purpose of the unit starters and, and how uh, they were put together and how to think about enduring understandings and the concepts uh, and uh, how we're not uh, doing a culminating task at the end that's not related to all of the things that we did to lead up to that. Uh, We're not just talking about that enduring understanding or that overarching concept at the very end and pulling it together, but we're leading up to that. And so I think they're going to be very well done and and well received. And in this way, districts can um, plan training for teachers that are in short bursts and then have them implement the the unit starters. We're also um, focusing some um, coaching protocols around topics that will help our coaches in the Read to Be Ready network to um, coach around some of this work as as teachers are implementing unit starters. So, Vicki, what then do you think success would look like for you all? What do you want to... What would you want to see in next year's reading report that would tell you that you all had been successful in this effort over the, over the last year? So I would want to see that many classrooms across the state have used the unit starters and have tried out this way of teaching reading. And we are already seeing mindsets change, teachers' attitudes change about things, higher expectations for students. We're seeing more writing now. And so I'd like to see that just increase. I'd like to see more writing when we do our walkthroughs to uh, analyze the instructional shifts that we need to see. I would, we're seeing better content. I'd like to see that in classrooms across the board, that they're using uh, texts that are worthy of students' time, that they're understanding how to build knowledge across those texts, and that they are asking good questions and assigning good tasks to students. If we would begin to see that in a... Uh, in many more classrooms across Tennessee, I think we're we're making real progress. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, Vicki, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today about this important issue and about the third reading report that the department just released this week. And oh, I'm going to be you. It's been a pleasure. I'm going to be really excited to go home and tell my son that we talked about Skippy John Jones on a podcast. Oh, tell him I'd love to read one of the books with him sometime. Oh, uh, you got it. It's a date. Thanks, Vicki. Right. Bye, Vicki. Bye, bye. So this brings us to the end of our third episode of the 10th period, which, um, as always, has been so enjoyable. And it's really fun to get to talk about something um, that feels so personally invested in, I think, you and I both as parents. Laura, what, what was your biggest takeaway from this week's episode? I really enjoyed talking to Beth and hearing about the connections that her students are making. And this makes me determined to continue, you know, researching in this area and putting out our findings and encouraging more people to um, take... Uh, in the documents that the department has, re- the training the department has released, and hopefully a lot of people will take a look at those one pagers. I love the one pagers that are that are tied to the instructional focus areas. I was struck by a couple of things. One is just the way in which I think people are sort of um, from from Molly to Beth to Vicky thinking about sort of meth- methodically how you start to change the practice around some of these things. Um, but also from the research perspective, I'm, I'm thinking about um, a couple of different research projects that we might have going into the field and the way in which we connect to these practices and observing whether or not practices are happening, not only in the places that you all have been doing the work and doing the observations, but actually in other classrooms around the state to what extent are we seeing these same kinds of things or not? um, And how might that help inform sort of next steps? So um, so that's a big and important takeaway for me as we think about planning our next set of research. 
So make, the kids are making connections in the classroom. You're making connections from <laughs> research project to research project. <laughs> um, well, that's about it. Um, I think upcoming in our f- future episodes, we're going to be covering things like uh, school leadership, um, talking about results from our annual educator survey, and talking a little bit more about school improvement. And again, if you have any things um, that you, our listeners, um, feel like you want to know more about in the research areas in Tennessee, uh, we'd love to hear those. You can follow us on Twitter at 10 Ed Res Alliance. You can also reach us via email at 10 ed.research.alliance at vanderbilt.edu. And you can continue to find the 10th period on iTunes and SoundCloud. And please do sign up um, as a subscriber and also let us know what you think. Um, so thanks so much for joining us again. Thanks as always to my compatriot, Laura. Um, it's been fun and it'll continue to be fun as we go forward. So. Thanks, Aaron. We hope that you all go out there and are thinking about your favorite children's books and uh, reading. <laughs>